want to build a system with Intel's new 10th generation CPUs, or maybe even what's beyond that's apparently going to support PCI Express 4.0? Well, that's not out yet. I don't know. I've got a deal for you. The MSI MPG Z490. This is the Gaming Edge Wi-Fi version of this motherboard. If you don't need the Wi-Fi version, you can obviously not get the Wi-Fi version and save a few bucks, but this is a really good deal for a Z490 motherboard. I'm going to take a look at it specifically with the 10600K, although even if you were running the i9, the 10900K, or the i7, this would be a perfectly suitable motherboard. Really, the thing with the 10th gen CPUs is they drink the power. They really drink the power. The power delivery system on this motherboard is 12 60 amp phases, which is adequate unless you're going to spend more on your cooling setup than you did on your entire rest of your machine. So, there you go. And I sort of joke when I say, oh, you know, I'll talk you out of it, but the Intel CPUs are actually very uh, fast for single thread performance, and a lot of stuff is dominated by single thread performance. That's not untrue, especially in gaming land. And so I think the most interesting CPU released so far as of this video from Intel is the 10600K. Now, there are going to be other motherboards that are LGA1200 that support other CPUs. And it may be that one of the non-CPUs will become even more interesting because some of those do look really interesting on paper. The problem is that you don't want to spend north of $200 US for a motherboard. Well, right now, this motherboard is right at $200 US, which is a pretty good deal for, for what it is, like I say. But we're gonna take a look at this system in a build with uh, the i5-10600K. We're gonna do some tuning and um, we're gonna get this thing to actually run faster than a 10900K out of the box. Yeah, I know, Steve at Gamers Next, he beat me to it, but that's cool because, you know, the, the whole mesh ratio thing, like you just, you... for those of you not in the know, let me start again. Intel CPUs, these, these, this type of Intel CPU operates on kind of a ring bus and you can make the ring bus go faster. You can overclock that independent of clock speed. You can also overclock the cache memory. So Intel CPUs have cache memory, you know, and that caches stuff that's happening in the CPU so that it doesn't have to do the round trip to main memory, which is quite slow in comparison because, you know, when we're talking about billionths of a second, you know, in one five billionth of a second, light can travel about this far. So that's, you know, one clock tick of your CPU. The speed of light, which is the fastest thing there is, goes about that far. Yeah, so uh, having to go to main memory is slow and glacial in comparison, so cache memory speeds that up. Well, you can overclock cache memory. The problem is if you over overclock it too much, you're going to introduce errors in your system. This system behind me is a 7980XE, and it will outrun every 10980XE that I've tested, sometimes by a few percentage points, sometimes by like seven or eight percent. The reason for that, well, there's two reasons. One, it doesn't have any hardware mitigations for the security issues. Mitigating those security issues, those Intel flaws, cost performance. And so if you get a 10980, it's gonna have some of those performance. So you lose, but if you do the software fixes on this, then you also lose performance. So six one way, half a dozen the other. But also the cache ratio on the CPU and uh, you know some other tunables like that on this CPU will really set it apart. It will go incredibly, incredibly fast when you've got the uh, the cache memory basically running full speed, flat out, just just running as fast as it possibly can. There's a couple cores in this in this uh, uh, CPU that are turds also, so they uh, they don't run very fast. But all of the other cores, pretty much 4.5 gigahertz, 4.6 gigahertz, which for an 18 core 7980XE, it's pretty good. Even though the CPU architecture is different, you can apply a lot of those same. Uh, tuning parameters to this thing, and MSI gives you the options to do that in their UEFI. And this is our board. <laughs> no frills, definitely no frills, but look, it's got an integrated IO shield. Just the little things, little things they can do like that that don't really increase the cost, but increases the quality of life. Now some of their other higher end boards that are like $50, $60 more, you do have, you know, multiple heat sinks for your M.2, which meh. And the power delivery system. Okay, now that we're looking at it, this is a 12 plus one, plus one uh, power phase delivery. So you've got one power phase for the system agent, one power phase for the integrated GPU. So that might be a concern in the future, with future CPUs if you were gonna do iGPU overclocking. For the current, you know, the 10600K and the 10900K, the iGPU hasn't really changed much. So that single power phase for that is totally fine. I keep seeing rumors about Intel XE, 
So again, speculation. Let's not speculate about future products. The PCIe layout is pretty good. You know, you get the triple slot thing. It's a X16 or by eight by eight. And these are your slots that go directly to the CPU. So that's pretty much as expected. And then you've got two by one slots. I would have loved to see a by four slot on the bottom here for a media or capture card that could go through the chipset, but hey, you know what, I'll live. We've got one M.2, which is through the chipset. And we've got the other M.2 here, which is also through the chipset because that's how it rolls on Intel systems, at least with current generation CPUs. We've also got USB type C, which is an unusual on a relatively inexpensive motherboard, 30 pin type header, four SATA connections on the front, two SATA connections on the bottom. We also have Corsair uh, digital uh, RGB headers, as well as several 5050 and addressable RGB headers scattered around the motherboard. We've also got a four pin Thunderbolt header, but I would definitely not recommend this motherboard for Thunderbolt because it doesn't have that PCI Express by four slot directly to the chipset. Using Thunderbolt with this motherboard is gonna be a little problematic. You're gonna be using CPU lanes and it'll be an X4 card in an X8 slot. So it's gonna relegate your, your GPU down to X8 from X16. So you should probably get one of the higher end boards. Oh, and if you are gonna get an i9 that has you know, ridiculous uh, cooling that you're gonna, you know, try to push to the limit, or you're worried about future CPUs, you should probably look at the MSI uh, Mag Ace Z490 because that has uh, a higher end, you know, more phases and more amps uh, power implementation than, than this motherboard. But this motherboard is, I mean, most of the bulk of this motherboard is the thermal mass right here. And goodness, there's a lot of thermal mass around our, uh, our VRM area, so. MSI knows what's up with the 10th gen and the power utilization is what I mean. Other than that, at the rear I.O., we've got a combo PS2 mouse and keyboard port. Always nice for somebody like me that's using a Model M. I've got two USB 2 ports, DisplayPort and HDMI. That's for the iGPU. We've got 10 gigabit and 20 gigabit USB connections. So the 20 gigabit is the reversible type C and the 10 gigabit is the type A. Then we've got two more five gigabit USB ports. And then above that, we've got our two and a half gig Realtek NIC. Now, Intel does offer their own two and a half gig networking solution. However, the first versions of that silicon had some problems that motherboard vendors like MSI sort of tripped over. So there's a little hesitation to use the Intel networking chipset. I think those issues have been resolved in silicon, but it was sort of down to the wire in manufacturing. So there are uh, some Z490 motherboards that will use Intel's two and a half gig solution. In this case, we're using Realtek's Dragonland uh, solution. We've also got an Intel Wi-Fi 6 solution, optical SPDIF, and a Realtek ALC1220 based audio codec implementation. In the box, also no frills. You get the MSI case badge, obviously obligatory, you need that. We've got the driver and installation manual, cable label stickers, all of the usual accoutrement. Thank you and, you know, thank you and a quick install guide and some M.2 screws because you need to not lose those because they're all different. Get two SATA cables. <laughs> Just two SATA cables in the box. Does anybody even use SATA anymore? And then we got two rubber duck antennas. I would have liked to have seen MSI spend an extra dollar or two for better Wi-Fi 6 antennas, but Hey, at this price point, that's not too bad. The second thing that you notice on this motherboard after the weight of the VRM is the PCB is super thin, like super thin. Usually that means that there are fewer layers on the PCB and that can mean that you have uh, reduced high speed memory compatibility. MSI's maximum advertised speed for this board is 4,800. I don't have memory anywhere near that fast to be able to test it. However, I do have DDR4 4000. It's not the best, it's a little older. And of course that worked fine. For our build, we're gonna be using Team Group memory. This is the Team Group T-Force ARGB Extreme DDR4 Gaming. This is 16 gigabytes. If you're building an i5 gaming system, 16 gigabytes, you could go 32, you could populate all four DIMMs. This motherboard does support up to 128 gigabytes of memory, but if you're spending that much on memory, you should probably have first maxed out, first your GPU, and then your CPU, and then maybe a better motherboard, and then maybe 128 gigs of memory. There's also storage in there too. So there's a lot of things that you would buy before you buy 128 gigs of memory, unless you're doing some really, really super specialized stuff. But you know, there you go. Team Group, if you've never heard of Team Group, I've been using Team Group since before they decided to embrace the RGB. You remember the laptop memory shortage, like the DDR3 laptop memory shortage from like five or six years ago? I imported so much Team Group notebook memory. It was crazy because they still had a reasonable price on it 
and uh, you know, even during the shortage, it was, you know, it's still an elevated price, but it's still really good. And that's when uh, I sort of got acquainted with Team Group. And I've used Team Group memory in some high-end builds and other builds and stuff like that. So it's a brand I'm familiar with. But they reached out and said, hey, you want some memory? And I said, we're going to do an i5 build with it. And so this is the MSI build that's using the Team Group memory. So I'm actually probably going to do some, some other builds with this as well, including some Team Red builds. But uh, this is a DDR4 3600 kit, but it's designed to run at 1.45 volts. It's a little bit elevated voltage, but hey, 3600. Another key component of our build is going to be CPU cooling. So we got the Pure Rock 2 from Be Quiet. Now, we did a little bit of poking around with this on the live stream, and it was pretty awesome. This is about $40 US right now at the time of this video. You can get the black version for a few bucks more. But this is a really competent cooler, especially when we're talking about an i5, because obviously it doesn't make sense. If you're going to spend $250 on your CPU, you're not going to spend $100 on your cooling solution. You should just get a different CPU if you were gonna spend that much. This is about 40 bucks. We're gonna push it as far as we possibly can. Now in the Be Quiet box, you do get enough fan clips to do a push-pull configuration. So if you've got another 120 millimeter fan, you can set it up on the back and have a push-pull configuration. But uh, we've just got the one, so I'm just gonna set up the one fan. Our Pure Rock 2 is installed and more importantly, check it out. We've got plenty of clearance for RAM. All right, we're fully set up. I've got our 2080 Ti in there, which again, mixing a 2080 Ti and an i5, I mean, okay, maybe. A lot of games don't really use more than six cores and ah, that's a whole other argument, but this will be the absolute maximum difference, worst case scenario. Although, you know, maybe there are new GPUs coming out. This video could still be relevant in August of 2020, depending on how fast the new GPUs are. I mean, it's possible, but this is a totally stock configuration. We go, we're six away from Leet. Yeah, so 1331 score on our single core score, 7310 for our multi-core score on our i5 10600K. So this is really pretty good. I mean, we're talking better than i7 8700K performance from just a few years ago, right out of the box, only enabling XMP. We're also gonna use Shadow of the Tomb Raider to do some frame rate tests, because it's got a pretty good built-in benchmark that can show us some graphs. One thing about running CPU-Z, is that if you've got a bad overclock, you'll know pretty quickly because when you start doing the multi-thread, it'll start out at a really high number and then it'll come back off really quickly. And that's a sign that your CPU is throttling. You might want to run Hardware Info 64 and see what your temperature is doing and if you're getting thermal throttling and what your current temperatures are. So you can see here that, you know, our worst case scenario so far has been like nothing. So I'm just gonna leave that running in the background for now. Here's our final result. We're basically stuck with XMP configuration. No thermal throttling, not even close. Not even a little bit close. Our peak temperature, looks like about 55 degrees C. So our Pure Rock 2 is doing pretty good at stock configurations. However, our peak CPU clock is only about 4.3, 4.4 gigahertz, 4.1. Some of our other core clocks really, not really as high as I would expect, but again, you know, Tomb Raider is a little bit multi-threaded, but not super multi-threaded. So it's, it's pretty good for this kind of test. Even though it is an older game. Overall performance, 151 FPS, 23,592 frames rendered. GPU bound about 39% of the time. So basically all we're doing is targeting a per core speed of 50, which is gonna be five gigahertz. Uh, you might try setting it to 50 or 51 for one or two cores. And you also want to pay attention to your first. So first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth. This might not be in the same order. Core zero for you might be the fifth most favorite core. Generally, your most favorite cores are going to be the ones that clock the highest. Ring ratio, I've adjusted up from 3800 to 4000. So as we can see, everything is running at 5 gigahertz basically across the board. I did not have to mess with voltage yet, although sometimes you may have to increase your voltage to get stability. And that's where you uh, also run into problems. So let's do a benchmark of the CPU. So 4,500, 4,400, oh, but then it died. So for the CPU voltage override, I'm gonna set adaptive plus offset, and we'll leave the core voltage on auto, and we will add just a tiny, tiny little bit of voltage. I'm gonna start with 0 0.070. So probably not enough, but we'll see. 
and we can see immediately the temperatures are quite a bit higher 78 degrees 76 degrees 81 degrees we're not quite in the danger zone and we're enjoying quite a bit more stability now cpu z is really kind of a terrible program for benchmarking but it's quick and easy and just sort of a fast sanity check because i mean already for single thread we're getting 580 which is about 80 points higher than stock and part of that is because i dialed in five gigahertz and part of it is because it's also actually now stable so let's run shadow of the tomb raider and see what we get on the gaming side of things so with this overclock it was pretty stable average fps 166 gpu bound 38 percent of the time you know our peak temperature was about 75 80 82 degrees c 5 gigahertz so there you go pretty much the maximum top end build unless you go for an i9 with this motherboard in which case if you're going to go an i9 it really depends on how far you're going to push it in terms of cooling but our pure rock cooler is doing okay it's not doing terrible it's not overheating or anything like that but the intel cpus really really push it now on the box for this cooler it says 150 watt tdp but intel's playing games a little bit that tdp rating because you're gonna need about 200 watts of cooling with an overclock for these more extreme processors intel also has a lot of good thermal management stuff in their cpu it is it is legit quite good they've made improvements to the uh, integrated heat spreader and some other stuff for heat management. I kind of wish some of those things had been there on prior generation CPUs, but overall the CPUs do have a better ability to carry heat away from the CPU. So the better the cooling solution, the better the setup. This setup is great. I mean, for 40 bucks for an i5, five gigahertz, all six cores, no problems. And we're basically at 8086, like the Intel 8086 anniversary edition six core. We're basically at that performance and better, even a little bit better because I'm running my ring ratio at 4000 instead of 3800. Now with this particular CPU, I can up the voltage a little bit more and I can get 5.1 gigahertz, but that's gonna push past what this cooler is able to do. That's also not gonna be stable as a result of that because it's running so hot all the time. Now, as with anything, overclocking is gonna vary from chip to chip. Not everybody's gonna be able to achieve the same result. Gamers Nexus did a wonderful video on the particulars of increasing the ring ratio. They had a little different setup than I do, but it is pretty easy, it's pretty accessible. And this MSI motherboard works pretty great for that. Middle of the road without spending a whole bunch of money on your you know, Z490 10th gen Intel CPU motherboard. I can't wait for the Intel CPUs to come out that support PCI Express 4. This is, these CPUs are just gonna tide us over until then. So here's hoping for, you know, awesome stuff in the future. I'm Wendell, this is level one, I'm signing out. I'll see you later. And I'm already 3D printing my next project. That's what's going on in the background, so. Woo.